So welcome to the first session of Postcolonial Theory as Cinematic Fantasy. Um, this session is about, um, well, the title is pretty self-explanatory, but I'll just read a little bit from the description. Um, the archive and its geography stand out the most in Hugo Olson's film concerning violence. Nine scenes from the anti-imperialist self-defense, self a film following Franz Fanon's philosophical exegesis, The Wretched of the Earth. The amount of attention paid to geography in the film has an ontological relation to colonialism. Geography is central to imperial expansion and as the foremost tool of colonial navigation. The focus on the archive is similarly obs obsessive, giving the illusion that all African anti-colonial movements occurred at the same time. This point of view is admittedly skewed. Irit Rogoff's prediction that these movements in Africa raptured the historiography and political culture of America and Europe is useful in contemplating Olsen's film. However, the genesis of these many events is hardly narrated. Um, this seminar will be led by Sarah Beery, uh, Moses. I'll just read a little bit from his uh, bio. Uh, Sarah Beery is an independent writer and curator. His essays are published in Chimurenga um, con and Contemporary End. His research and curatorial projects include Life, Life Musiti, a series of public programs with the Guta Center Kampala, the Biennial Contemporary Art Festival, Cla Art Unmapped, mm -hmm. among others. He has produced essays on African artists and curators from the online magazine Contemporary And. Uh, and Sir was also part of the uh, team, part of the curatorial team for the 10th uh, Berlin Biennial uh, for Contemporary Art. He has served as faculty and is alumnus of the Aseco International Art School and was awarded the 2015, um, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, uh, Stadtschreiber. Stadtschreiber uh, residency at Beirut Academy of Advanced African Studies. Um, we're also hoping that each of you could um, give just a short introduction of yourselves and just sort of maybe a little bit of like what brings you to this class today. Um, I will start off with um, Alejandra. Hi. 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 Well, I'm Alejandra. I'm a Mexican artist and an archivist. Um, yeah, I'm studying tropical tropical landscape in Mexico in the south in the coast of in Veracruz. Uh, that is a state in the southeast of Mexico. So I'm very interested in stories about uh, no, like the colonialism ways, and that's why I'm super interested in this class. And I also see Chimurenga and Musota Mayor when they came to Mexico City. So yeah, yeah, I'm really interested in this kind. Yeah, also Veracruz has a African diaspora, mm -hmm. and it's one of the places that has this uh, African diaspora in Mexico, but it's not recognized in the histories here. No, it's only like uh, Aztecs and Spanish came here, and nobody else. So mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ali Aksay, uh, can you tell us how to pronounce your name correctly? Uh, yes, it's Alexei. Alexei, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, my name is Alexei. I'm from Belarus. Uh, I, I graduated uh, from Masters at the from University of Helsinki uh, from Intercultural Encounters. So, my basic training comes from uh, post colonial, decolonial studies, and gender studies. Uh, I've been always uh, very interested in this topic. More recently, I've been switching towards uh, post-humanism and new materialism, but uh, still I have a uh, very huge class very appealing, so I'm really looking forward. Great. Uh, um, uh, Ellen? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Ellen. I'm, uh, I'm originally from London. I'm currently living between London and Switzerland at the moment. Um, I studied fine art originally and then moved into visual anthropology. And a lot of my practice, both as a visual anthropologist for myself and 
in a corporate sense. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm working as a visual anthropologist for myself in my own practice and in, in a corporate sense. Um, but in my own practice, I'm mostly working with uh, subjects who were from former colonies, particularly in the UK. And so looking at kind of how the post-colonial discussion has uh, developed or not developed um, within the UK. And I largely uh, then turn my research into films. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, um, uh, Kirsten? Okay, um, hi, I'm Kirsten. Um, I, um, I'm an art historian uh, based in New York. I'm in a PhD program at CUNY Graduate Center. Um, and I'm, I'm working on developing a dissertation topic that looks at um, experiments in film, video and television um, and, and liberation movements here in the US um, in the 60s and 70s. And so I was, I heard about this class and was, um, and I've been kind of, I'm very in the very early stages and interested in exploring different ways of theorizing the relationships between cinema and, and, and um, liberation struggles um, and thinking as well a lot about the dream and fantasy and um, uh, imagine the imaginary so excited to be here great uh nikki hi can you hear me yeah hi uh, my name is nikki uh, i'm a designer researcher um, i don't have a very simple answer for why i'm interested in this course i think largely because i I live in a very predominantly Slavic and Arab city that's situated within, uh, called Hamtramck, which is situated within a majority black city, Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. And I do activist work uh, here. And uh, yeah, it doesn't, uh, the topics of the class don't pertain so, a lot to my research about technology, but just from like, a very personal standpoint, the communal standpoint um, is very relevant to me. Great. Thank you. Um, Rabindra? Hello? Hi. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah I'm Rabindra from India, actually. I did a uh, Bachelor of Fine Art in the Holy College of Art and Craft. And right now I'm, uh, I'm teaching, yeah, so my pronunciation is very bad, I, I teach in a school. Okay. And yeah, same time, uh, I'm doing my practice in art. I'm most of work, my, uh, most of work in installation work, based on installation. Okay. Yeah. Is that enough? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just trying to make sure. Uh, Sasha? Uh, yeah, hi. I, I'm not sure you can see me. Just a sec. Ah, uh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I have minor technical problems. So uh, I'm not sure you, can, uh, you can't really see me right now. Uh, so I uh, live in Moscow. Uh, and uh, currently I'm uh, not... Uh, a, in any other uh, academic institution. So um, I recently finished my MA, MA in contemporary theory. And uh, I guess I uh, relatively recently got uh, interested in um, post-colonial and uh, decolonial theory. Uh, I uh, suppose that for uh, post-Soviet countries, uh, there is a special, uh, there is a really specific situation, uh, which is uh, quite different uh, from uh, the one for um, uh, for UK and the US and uh, for for instance UK colonialism uh, so um, and but I um, but to I suppose to understand uh, the um, post-Soviet uh, situation uh, better I um, I suppose I need I read I need to read uh, and explore uh, 
post-colonial theory uh, much more. So, and I suppose this is how I got interested in this class. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sebastian? Um, hey, uh, my name is Sebastian and I'm currently finishing my MA in Curatorial and Critical Studies in Frankfurt in Germany. And I guess that the reason why I chose this class is because I wrote my bachelor thesis on the issues of exhibiting film in exhibition spaces and the temporalities that pertain to this um, problematic. But also I've recently became more interested in this notion of film uh, as a mode of theoretical production without itself being reduced to theory, uh, which I found something uh, quite compelling and I want to look into it a bit more. But also um, I am occasionally um, researching the certain genealogies of um, Eastern European um, avant-garde films. Um, and yeah, this might, might perhaps tie in with some of the, let's say, more peripher peripheral um, cinematic forms that are going to be explored in this class. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, so I guess I'll just pass it on to Sergei. Yeah, uh, Kelly, you didn't introduce yourself. But... Oh, yeah. Um... <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm Kelly. Uh, I am an MFA student at Columbia, um, and a lot of my sort of like questions in my work are kind of looking at how individuals relate to the state and how the state relates to the individual, um, which is a really broad question <laughs> um, and has many different sort of iterations. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for now. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, hi. I'm. I'm really. Uh, I'm really glad uh, to have all of you in this um, class and in this program. Um, I am very, very interested in. Um, in having conversations, obviously, uh, around the topic of not only post-colonialism, but also of um, uh, how we conceive of history outside of Europe and outside of the United States. Um, and uh, this has somehow preoccupied my, um, my past, you know, um, my practice in general. Um, for this class, I will, I guess, get straight into the the the, the first film. Um, well, the, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the different films that we're going to cover um, in this class. Um, so the first one, Hugo, uh, Olsen, uh, Hugo uh, Olsen uh, is a concerning violence, nine scenes from the anti-imperialist self-defense. And uh, I chose the preface or introduction for us to sort of study as a, as a very crucial part of that film, actually. It just happened to be um, available as well. Um, but I heard from Kelly that the entire film is available on Facebook. <laughs> uh, and so Kelly needs to share the link. So if you haven't seen the entire film, you should um, see it. Um, in the next classes, uh, there will be more than more than the actual assigned films to 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 see. Um, all the films are available on the internet that I have um, provided in the class um, in the in the uh, syllabus. Um, so, for example, uh, so for example. Um, in the in the coming seminar, we look at uh, the Statue Mercy, which is um, a film by Chris Marker, but which is commissioned, uh, which is commissioned by Présence Africaine, um, the 
a publishing house that was founded in Paris in the 1940s. And, you know, um, you know, uh, while I talk about that film <clears throat> in itself, I'm also really going to talk about um, uh, a few other things and the interrelationship between the kind of theory expressed in, for example, nine scenes of the anti-imperialistic anti self-defense and the statue Um I also will um, engage uh, the film by Jonna Comfra, The Last Angel of History, which is of course based on the Walter Benjamin essay. Um, that, that also session will really you know, go beyond just the film because it will include a sort of excavation of uh, the, the crucial methodologies that Benjamin sort of focused on and how uh, Black Audio Film Collective, you know, employed those methodologies. Um, we'll also look at uh, Edouard Glissant's, um, uh, well, we'll look at Mancha Jawara's portrait of Edouard Glissant, world on, on his world mentality, as it, uh, as he calls it. Um, but we'll also look at Osman Semben's La and and um, think about that film as well in relation to um, again, in relation to various theories that we're discussing uh, in the class up until that point. So once again, I'm, I'm really elated that all of you are part of this um, class. And um, to tell you a little bit about my methodology, um, I sort of use a very active uh, process of, of um, questions, and I would require you to pursue your own questions in this classroom uh, and not rely entirely on my questions. So while I have a, a lot of questions to ask, I will also request that you have or write down or jot down questions that you have um, in relation to the film, in relation to the text, in relation to um, other concerns that you may have. So, um, I'll read a little bit um, and then I will um, get into the, um, I'll show a little bit of a, a video clip, right Kelly? I'll, I'll, I'll sort of switch my um, screen a bit. So uh, violent dreaming, um, and this is in reference to the Hugo Olson film. The starting point for post-colonial theory as cinematic fantasy is a proposal that in order to consider the question of violence, we must look to the cinema and its depiction of violence. The question of what is violence is important here in contextualizing fantasy and cinema in relation to post-colonial theory. Definition in law is the unlawful exercise of physical force or intimidation by the exhibition of such force. If I am not mistaken, there are distinctions between violence as lawful and violence as unlawful. The distinction here that criminal violence or violence in criminal is defined this way um, as it is illegally carried out by a transgressive citizen. I'm aware that lawful violence is deemed such when carried out by the modern state. What Jean-Jacques Rousseau called the moment at which right took the place of violence and nature became subject to the law. Um, Friedrich Hegel wrote, right therefore is in general freedom as an idea. Right therefore is in general freedom as an idea. And right is something holy because it is the embodiment of self-conscious freedom. I'll repeat that. Right is something holy because it is the embodiment of self-conscious freedom. Hegel also described absolute free will as being integral to the philosophy of right. He says to have a right is therefore to have only a permission. 
perhaps this question, what is right? And another, what is absolute free will can help us understand what is at stake in either lawful or unlawful violence. Free will is premised on the question of right. Um, well, I'm sort of conflating there, but Karl Marx, who was influenced and follows Hegel, referred to right in relation to property and ownership. What Hegel called the absolute right of appropriation which man has over all things. Marx is suggesting that if a man has wealth, it is right that he ought to own slaves resonates, resonates with the idea of right. In the context in which slaves are property and commodities, um, man has, and in here man being white men, in general, have the same power over them as they ought to have over property and commodities. Any violence carried out against slaves is considered as, of course, right. In this context, violence was seen as lawful when done to African and Indian slaves. And when violence, and violence was deemed lawful when carried out against natives of an occupied territory, as in the colonization of San Domingo by Spain and later France. In the, con in the context, therefore, of post-colonial analysis and theory, the question, what is violence, shall be premised or seen in dialogue with what is right in an occupied territory. I want to linger on this for a moment. Violence, lawful violence, to be clear, has a subject, which is man, in quotes, in the philosophy of right. If we are truly to respond to Hegel's question of right, we must equally interrogate the idea of free will in the occupied land. I do not hesitate to record Hegel. The absolute right of the appropriation, which the absolute right of appropriation which man has over all things. The absolute right of appropriation which man has over all things. Um, in the context of the colony, the occupied territory or the plantation, violence is and was the legal right and abstract free will of whiteness. Um, and I go further to say whiteness is a sub theme in Fanon's book chapter concerning violence. So, I mean, that kind of um, shift is interesting to me because then whiteness here implies something racial, but in actual sense, we're just talking about humanism and how human, humanity was constructed in the 17th and 18th centuries. So we're not discussing necessarily the question of race, we're discussing humanity as it was understood. Um, so whiteness is a sub-theme in Fanon's book chapter concerning violence in Les Danes de la Terre. It can be easily said that this theme was explored in greater detail in his earlier book, Noir, Masque Blanc, from 1957. Consider Franz Fanon's statements on violence, such as how and when violence is seen in line with property, wealth, and occupancy. In the Hugo Goran Olsen film, um, concerning violence, nine scenes, nine scenes from the anti-imperialistic self-defense, whose script is derived from the book chapter of the same name, and whose voiceover is delivered by a Black American musician, Lauren Hill. Um, the voiceover declares, you are rich because you are white. The statement makes it clear that Fanon considers the right to wealth, the right, the abstract right, to wealth um, as one of the foundational myths of European colonialism. I will have to pause there because I think that um, while Fano doesn't actually make this conclusion, um, I think it's important to, to um, understand that he actually makes the connection between whiteness and wealth. And from my understanding of whiteness in this um, context, as I said, I think in Hegel and in Marx, whiteness is not necessarily racial. It's, it's about the human or man, as they say, man. 
Um, and so, you know, uh, in the context of European colonialism, that subject is displaced because humanity is transformed for purposes of, of um, subjugation, the dispossession, and, and in the process of that subjugation, that's where race uh, comes in. So racism, you know, is born out of this kind of forced subjugation in the creation of, of plantations, in the creation of colonies, in the creation of occupied territories, in occupying other people's um, land and dispossessing them of their property. That is where um, this thing called race is created. Um, however, if to go back to this idea of what are the founding myths of European colonialism, European colonialism itself, you know, you know, I feel was spearheaded by Spain in any case, uh, possibly in the, you know, uh, I should say, because I should say that starting in the, the 15th century, to be honest, when, you know, um, at last land was discovered in the, um, in the so-called new world. Um, and I should say that, um, you know, while Spain and, and, and France and, and subsequent sort of countries, um, including the Netherlands, you know, occupied various territories in the Caribbean, in Latin America, um, not quite in Africa yet, I believe, but um, in uh, in the United in, in what is now called the United States, or in in Middle America, you know, uh, Mexico, which became uh, uh, New Granada. Um, there was um, the idea that you know, man or humanity, uh, or the idea of of, hum of 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 the human, you know, could not necessarily be the same because um, there were people who were discovered necessarily in those places, and there were people who were coming to occupy those places, and in the role of the settler had to be redefined as somebody who was superior. Um, to um, others. And so while we do have a conception of, 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 of the human that, you know, again, was reorganized during enlightenment, but which goes further back than enlightenment, to be honest, uh, the, what we now know as in Hegel and Kant is the human that was described during enlightenment borrows very, very closely from um, the, the humanism that exists in Christianity, the humanism that exists in moral laws and, and in other laws uh, in Europe at the time, perhaps laws that have to do with um, the aristocracy, laws that have to do with the, um, the Roman Catholic Church, laws that have to do with uh, the Protestant Church. So um, these are all constructions of... of um, morality that shape the human. And so this newly created thing, you know, starting in the 15th century, um, the, the colony, as it were, you know, or let's just call it occupied land, presents a problem for, for the human. Who is human and, and what, is, what, is, what is human necessarily? What is man? Um, so later, of course, uh, I mean, in the short excerpt that we watched, um, you see that um, Gatry Spivak in particular sort of points out the, the, the problems of this um, perspective of violence, um, where on the one hand, anti-colonial violence removes gender boundaries, but on the other hand, once that um, violence has achieved its aims, you know, uh, gender barriers are immediately uh, upheld or they complete, they, they return. 
So, um, in that case, you know, we, we, you know, we have to also consider that anti-colonial anti violence may be a gendered violence as well. Uh, and so, the Native women, you know, whether they were in Mexico in the uh, 15th century or 16th century, or whether they were in Burundi in the uh, late uh, 19th century or in the mid 19th century, you still have that um, idea that um, even when anti colonial pricing is happening, um, uh, women, you know, uh, and their subjectivity comes also into um, the fold of questioning how we define humanity in the context of, of, of the colony and who actually is free, who has, who has rights necessarily. Um, so I will, okay, so um, uh, Fanon elaborates on this enterprise of colonialism as if it were a business, speaking of French colonial Algeria, the native understands that it is only through violence that he will destroy the enterprise of colonialism. Um, we can already uh, witness the tensions here between um, Fanon's earlier 1957 text and this later volume from 1961. Um, okay, so I, before I go any further, I think uh, because this later part kind of gets, in, gets deeper into Fanon's trajectory and his questions on pathology. I would like to sort of get into a discussion here or have a little bit of a discussion about violence. Um, and so I wrote down some questions of my own. I hope um, that either you're triggered by these questions or you can bring questions of your own. So, um, in relation to the Hugo Olson film, you know, what was, was the Nanaline movement uh, a form of anti-colonial self-defense? And if so, why is it not depicted in the film? Why do we only have guerrillas in the fighting in the bush and, you know, in the forests? We have Portuguese soldiers fighting in the bush and in the forest. We have, um, you know, white settlers in Rhodesia, you know, but we don't have the Nanaline movement. Um, so why is that? What desires can be traced in the archival pictures? And, and are there any desires which are traced in these archival pictures? Um, what is um, lawful and unlawful violence? And um, what is absolute free will, of course? What is right? And what is violence, period? Um, is violence carried out against slaves right? You know, what laws govern occupied territories? Are there any freedoms and personal liberties in the colonized territory? What is the enterprise of colonialism? Yeah. So that's, uh, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Um, oh, I, I also wanted to um, play a little bit of this film. Um, that shows de Gaulle at the beginning of the Algerian war. Um, and so I'll share my screen. Kelly, is that fine? Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll share my screen. Oh. 
Charles de Gaulle, the grandeur of France, and the grinding six-year war in Algeria. All Algeria is divided into three forces, the Muslim natives, the French settlers, the French army. Over these, de Gaulle, hero of World War II, his job balancing the forces, restoring peace. Against him, General Raoul Salon, a waverer, paratroop general Jacques Massou, Jacques Soustel, once de Gaulle's lieutenant. Pierre Lagayard, an extremist. Ferhat Abbas, FLN leader. Charles de Gaulle. And the six-year Algerian war. Algiers, a busy piece of metropolitan France, transplanted across the Mediterranean. Frenchmen have lived and ruled here since 1830. More than one million Frenchmen in Algiers rub elbows with more than 10 million Muslims. Man on horseback, symbol of France, stands in Algiers' main square. On the surface, Muslim and Frenchmen live well together. They shop in the same stores. Street cafes on a quiet afternoon. Even a milk bar. The Casbah, the Muslim quarter. Locale of a thousand adventure stories. A part of the non-French past. Okay. Um. Oh, wait. Oh, it's up here. Okay. So... Um, I welcome any body who would like to contribute to the discussion. Uh, I have a question maybe about this definition of freedom to the Hegelian idea of right. Uh, so isn't it that uh, this Hegelian understanding of right is, is a little bit like uh, constructing the basis for liberation and attempting to legitimize it in the Western discourse of science. Mm -hmm. uh, do you maybe perceive it uh, as uh, somewhat limiting maybe, or somewhat uh, problematic or, or not? Just, just wondering. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I assume that, um, I assume that uh, that um, I assume that this is one of the challenges of postcolonial theory, because um, analysis, as we understand it, was at least as Christeva talks about it, is is firmly a discipline, and um, analytical work also has a trajectory. So, in a way, um, Fanon is Freudian. Right. Um, I read a text recently um, that said that Fanon uh, challenges Freud's assumptions. I don't know about what, to be honest. Um, but in my reading and in Christeva's reading as well, I mean, it's very clear how Freudian Fanon's analysis is. Um, and so also in relation to this question of freedom and actually not so much freedom, but the question of rights, because I feel freedom is a more Kantian question, um, which I think also Fanon is, he's very much following Kant and therefore is a very Kantian thinker. Um, but in relation to rights specifically, um, I understand that, um, that colonial, Colon colonies of, of, oh, actually, I understand that colonial law itself, um, in regard to here, uh, I will point out Le Code Noir, Le, Le Code Noir, which is uh, the, 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 the Black Code, or the, the law that France put in place in, in its, I mean, majority of its colonies, um, was certainly based on um, like I said, you know, following more law in Europe and, and following other kind of um, constitutional laws that were governing France and the aristocracy in, in France. So when 
when we when we think about Hegel's understanding of right, I think that there's um, there's a way in which it you know it relates directly to how colonial laws were were designed. It, if not, it relates very strongly to how European laws were designed um, in the 19th, but also in the 18th and before, centuries and before, before that. But it, in, in terms of, is it problematic? I would, would leave that to you <laughs> because I, I think that um, I, I would like to know how you identify the problem as well. What exactly is the problem with with understanding the colony through Hegel and through Hegel's um, philosophy of right? Uh, maybe what I meant is just uh, simply the limiting of discourse, but uh, your answer, I totally understand what you mean, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Alexei. Yeah. Do we have do we have some more contributions? Mm, I could go down the list and see if people have any questions. Um, okay. Alejandra? <laughs> yeah, this is according to the video and uh, how the violence can be represented in the discourse and in the tone of the voice and the music and um, yeah, I was thinking about it and also because I read the text uh, and they were also talking about the cinema, the representation of how they are trying to, I don't know, make a twist. Yeah, that's all. So. Mm hmm. Okay. And what did you what did you make of that kind of uh, the the relationship between uh, the video that we just watched and the I'm assuming you mean the Isaac Julian Mark Nash text. Yeah. 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 I didn't see the film, so I'm I think that I'm just re I'm just talking about the text. So mm -hmm. I don't know because I don't have the entire information of that. So I only can repeat what they say in the text that. And they are trying to put like a collage of images mm -hmm. um, and don't try to make this this video that we already see now. Um, but yeah, th I think I need to see the film for think about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Did we did we all have a chance to look at um, uh, the introduction by Gatri Spiva or? Yeah. yeah. What what were some of our thoughts on that? Uh, I think Spivak uh, was trying to introduce the gender agenda. Uh, she she was trying to make a connection in between Phantom and the gender in the film. Mm -hmm. But I but in the text of Julia, <laughs> yeah, they were talking that um, Fanon didn't have a dialogue with gender and I don't know that women didn't have a uh, didn't have a, um, I don't know a conversation with Fanon. No, so there is a problem with Fanon that it's about men. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I would like to talk about it. Yeah, that's how it's it. In relation to this, I also like how uh, Spivak at the end of her talk uh, summarizes kind of that both the colonizer and colonized are united in the violence of gender at the end. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, those are a lot of um, lot of observations. They are great, really, really great observation, Alexei um, and Alejandra. Um, do we have more uh, observations about um, 
either what we just watched or Spivak's uh, preface? Um, I'll just, I'll keep moving down the, um, the list. Um, mm -hmm. Sebastian, any thoughts? Um, on the text, yeah, I thought it was maybe important how Spivak emphasized that um, this anti-colonial struggle is really something that every generation needs to kind of like comprehend and learn. So to me, this really pointed to some sort of a um, um, trans-temporal dimension of colonialism. This is what I remembered most from the text, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, uh, Rabindra? Uh, can you help me? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I don't have any questions. Because I really, I didn't prefer, I didn't read the text. Okay. And do you, did you just see the, the film that I, uh, that I just uh, screened right now? Or did you get a sense of it or? Right now, actually not because this is very new for me as a film. Mm -hmm. So I, I need more time to understand more. Oh, the, I mean, I meant the film I just showed right now. Did you see that or no? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Great. Um, I, I maybe have a question to like everyone. So yeah. I think at the end, Spivak uh, tries to actualize Fanon and uh, she says that at here we would need more of him. And uh, I didn't really get like where exactly she thinks that we will need more of Panama nowadays. Maybe if some would understand it will to clarify this. Mm -hmm. So um if I'm to yeah. What is what does everyone think about that? Yeah. Um. Uh Nikki. Hey, um, I had a hard time hearing, uh, hearing the prior statement, but I had a, um, a thought about the clip we watched. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in, in propaganda. Um, that was pretty fascinating, the, just like witnessing the filmic construction of, the, of an ideology of a peaceful occupation. Uh, for the colonial archive, it serves serves the enterprise. Um, yeah, it's just fascinating and scary. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Kirsten, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, I Alexa was your question: Why Spivak thinks we need more Fanon now? Or uh, kind of where we needed, yeah, because I didn't really get it when she was trying to actualize it to bring him back. Well, I think, I mean, I think I, just to maybe partly address that, I think that um, one of the things she's doing is kind of reassessing the role of violence in Fanon's text. And so maybe um, partly the argument is that we need um, a shift in the understanding of violence. And I think one of the things she does is. Um, kind of thinking about the origins of violence or maybe the impetus or where, where it comes from Fanon kind of treats violence as this almost a natural law or a kind of law of physics um in its in its movements um and and then and then what Spivak does is actually place this impetus not among Fanon would say um that it comes kind of directly as a response from the very poor and then and um and Spivak I was interested to hear us say that actually the poor is kind of called on by the state or the emerging or still imaginary state. So I think I think one of the things she's I saying is that the role of violence in Fanon needs really to be rethought, and also then and then not call for the shift to thinking about I mean um, work of care actually rather than just this mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution. Yeah. Maybe can I add something to that as well? Um, and I'm oh, sorry. 
Go on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Um, just uh, in the sense that I also thought she was quite directly referencing Sartre and how he had then originally written the preface to The Wretched of the Earth. And I kind of felt like in a way it could be a response to that because, I mean, if you put a preface, it comes at the beginning and then what follows is also partly, you know, a continuation of that. And by aligning our thought at the start of it, I felt like she was trying to maybe correct or just realign some of the, um, perhaps what she sort of, what I understood from what she'd written as misinterpretations um, by Sartre um, in reference to Fanon's uh, original writing. And I think she read something, she wrote him something about how he had like uh, not read between the lines um, and, uh, and said how, uh, I mean, maybe condoned violence more than he was actually trying to do. And I kind of felt like when she said, especially that this was a teaching text, that it was sort of setting the picture straight for what was to follow. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe just trying to realign some of the misinterpretations surrounding it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Sasha, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Um, I think we might have lost Sasha. Is Sasha, are you there? Okay, maybe. Maybe she needs to unmute. You can unmute the mic if you're there. Um, I think uh, yeah, I don't... Unmuting your mic. Hey. Hi. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm really sorry. Um, I will. I think I will uh, be able to answer anything uh, a bit later. I. Uh, I somehow have uh, emerg emergency, so I think I will uh, come. I will be able to participate in this session only. Um, only after the seminar and only um, online. I really hope this will sort itself out. I'm really sorry. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. So I guess like maybe Sir Barry, did you? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I yeah. I mean that's a that's a lot in terms of um, the different sort of, um, I guess, perspectives and positions um, that have been sort of brought forward. Um, I suppose just to go, uh, to go through them uh, would be uh, challenging, um, but I can try, you know, I guess at this moment, maybe to, um, just sort of hold some of the questions. Um, so, Alexei, your question was about, you know, the relationship between Hegel's sort of discourse of philosophy of right and um, post-colonial thought directly in relation to Fanon, especially, and whether there was a kind of um, disjuncture there or there was a kind of uh, problematic as to how one could relate to the other. Um, uh, was that is that was that your question, Mr. Yes, and now I think that would be very interesting to listen to anti-humanist uh, Fanon, <laughs> <laughs> if it would be possible. <laughs> right. Um, then we had. Um, Another uh, question, I, I, I think it was from Alejandra, who uh, brought up this idea of um, gender in um, uh, gender in um, in Spivak's preface, mm -hmm. and as well as you know how the, the the you know Isaac Julian and Mark Nash make known that uh, Fanon is not necessarily approaching or interesting in the question of gender. 
um, that's also a very, very in intense and interesting question. Um, um, particularly because I'm interested in this question, particularly because it allows um, it allows a particular relationship to um, to how Fano is discussed now in the in the present moment, and I think that I want to understand this in relation to South Africa in particular. Um, um, here I'm thinking about the recent movements, the Roads Must Fall movement, the student movements that are going on in South Africa, and how Fano has been used in those movements. Um, very much ties into the idea that um, his ideas um, are allowing students to galvanize and to um, sort of question the institutions that um, either are representing them or in which students are actually sort of inhabiting. And so I've read a couple of essays that um, in which um, young feminists on university campuses in South Africa are using Franz Fanon as a, a key um, text uh, to discuss questions of violence. But at the same time, Julia, who was uh, in previous class that I taught, um, well, a, a participant from a previous um, class I taught last year at the New Center, based in South Africa, said that um, she was part of this forum, which was a kind of black feminist forum, where you know the young women just wanted to say fuck Fanon um, and fuck you know all the other sort of post-colonial theorists. Like they kind of wanted to argue for an anarchistic discourse, but I also saw Fanon in that expression, you know, because yes, Fanon was all about fuck Fanon, you know, like that was his. If 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 there can be said to be uh, a discourse of freedom in Fanon, it's, it's very clearly uh, oh, a kind of fantasy in Fanon, like those fantasies are anarchistic. And so I feel very strongly that even though the students would either use Fanon or say fuck Fanon, there was something about what they were doing that was very anarchistic. Um, tearing down monuments, for example, you know, tearing down the monument of Cecil Rhodes throwing shit on the monument of Cecil Rhodes, you know, um, that for me is something that Fano would have been interested in, actually, you know, and so there's a way in which, um, well, I mean, for me, I see all these actions as, as, as not right. um, how Franz Fano uh, has been operating. Um, I see them more as uh, actually alongside and operating um, alongside some of Fanon's uh, expressions. Um, there was another question, I feel, um, by uh, Kirsten. Well, um, then Alexa, you asked this other question about how to read Fanon, I, I suppose, and how um, Spivak, in a sense, was reading Fanon. And then both Ellen and Kristen, Kirsten sort of provided these answers or um, clarifications as to how exactly it is we could read Fanon. Um, I think, uh, Ellen, you mentioned, um, well, uh, I think, uh, uh, Kirsten, you, you mentioned um, that uh, Fanon, that there was, um, that Spivak, uh, Spivak's sort of relationship to the text was very uh, much rooted in um, in um, in a, a, in, a, in a well. I mean, I think you were sort of commenting on 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 that very question, really, uh, that Alexei posed. Closed, um, and you were trying to sort of elaborate on readings um, of Fanon 
um, how do, I mean, but I think that that question itself of like, how do we actually read Fanon? Do we read Fanon the way he's written? And, or is there something more to, to, to what he's saying that we actually cannot actually tap into? We can't experience it, we can't see it. Um, the ideas of violence that, you know, are clearly uh, inscribed, uh, is there something else to them? Is there some, some other kind of interpretation that we can see? Um, how do, also do we fall into, how do we, excavate ourselves from these dichotomies of lawful and unlawful violence, you know, um, and in which ways do we leave room for Fanon to sort of like breathe into a kind of excess, I suppose, or a space of excess. Um, and I think that that is a very interesting uh, space, you know. Um, Ellen, I think you also pointed out uh, that um, you know, as a preface, you know, Spivak, Spivak's preface references another preface. Um, and so there's a process, sort of an intertextual process going on there between uh, Gatry Spivak and Jean-Paul Sartre. And she does mention Jean-Paul Sartre in, in the preface. But I also think that there's a very strong um, intellectual uh, intellectual history um, that connects the two figures, um, Spivak and Sartre, um, not only through Fanon, but I, I should say through um, just the, you know, the history of 20th century philosophy and how um, Spivak's work in relation to Derrida perhaps can be compared to um, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's work in relation to um, this existentialism and, um, and, and that entire sort of like line and history of thinkers. Um, it's very, under, it's understood that Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, critique, uh, I believe it's a critique of dialectic reason, um, is one of the uh, foremost texts on or one of the definitive texts on existentialism in the 20th century. Um, and so I, I see very strong, of course, Spivak's texts are definitive for us in how we understand um, uh, post-structuralism, uh, in how we understand uh, uh, the discourse of language in particular, um, how that has been mobilized in questions of uh, plantary, I mean, plantary is a concept that Spivak actually introduced into um, intellectual discourse um, of a certain discipline. Um, so yeah, I feel that there, there are very strong sort of intellectual connections between the two and reverberations. Um, perhaps I missed some of the other contributors and their contributions. Um, did we hear from Nikki or no? We did? Mm -hmm. yes. Right, yeah, um, yes. Nikki, could you, re uh, your question, I'm sorry, um, I must have. Um, I was um, just to uh, zone in on filmic construction of, of ideologies um, to construct the idea of, of peaceful occupation for the for the colonial archive and how it serves the enterprise. I, I was interested um, I'm interested in uh, in that that clip that we just launched and how the how I wonder I mean I don't know what year that was made but I, I wonder how the the mythology supported by the archive has trickled down to French and Algerian dispositions today. Right, right, and I think that that's a very um, very interesting um, way of of also viewing the the concerning violence film. Um, even though um, the film is not I mean, it's available now. You can click it <laughs> on Facebook. But um, 
I, it's a, it, I think that's a very, very apt way of thinking about the Concerning Violence film, which is made uh, also as a collage, um, as, Alexander, as Alejandra sort of um, pointed out, but which is made more so as uh, a collage of these kind of, uh, how should I call, some are propagandist actually, um, um, footages that are uh, in the, uh, wait one second. Um, Kelly, I kind of like moved my video thing. Could you put the spotlight? Um, sorry, you want me to spotlight you? Yes, thank you. Uh, you are spotlighted on my end. Oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought I, um, I thought I kind of removed the spotlight. I guess I didn't. Um, nope, you are spotlighted. Okay, thank you. On, on my end, yeah. Oh yeah, um, was, was I spotlighted for you guys as well or no? Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I mean, I think it's a great way to return to the film actually. Um, and to, to return to Fanon, because I think that the, the ideas in the film sort of uh, have very strong relation to um, archives. And um, the, a lot of the footage is actually just taken from archives, essentially. So what does that actually mean? Um, do those archives, um, is, is that footage actually part of a propaganda scheme? Um, you know, what does it mean that, you know, a major TV television station in the Netherlands or uh, in Denmark would have, you know, archives of an anti-colonial struggle in Mozambique or, in, excuse me, or in Angola. So how does that actually transform the way that we look at these archives, you know? Um, so um, I'll just continue suppose with some of my notes. Um, see, we're going very quickly, already an hour in. Um, so we can witness, um, uh, already witness the tensions here between Fanon's earlier 1957 text and this late, latter volume from 1961. The question in both texts of what is desire does not transpose very well. Desire in the context of the racialized pathology in Martinique that Fanon identifies in his earlier texts as this desire to be suddenly white is not the same desire that he witnesses in French Algeria. Indeed, pathology exists among the Algerian soldiers who are his patients and whose analysis continues the foundation of the 1961 book. But this swiveling between racial pathology in which Blacks experience deep internalized racism causes them perhaps in an unconscious sense to desire whiteness is contrasted with the horrific fantasies Fanon encounters in his Algerian patients. Those who are haunted by feelings of guilt that cause a stream of images of those slain by their own hand. It is a different kind of pathology. The mulatto woman in Martinique is deemed superior to the blacks, both men, and women in the territory as she's desirable to the white male uh, French colonists. Fanon writes in Pumois, from one day to the next, the mulatto went from a class of slaves to that of masters. Their pathology has to do with the slippage of the, their social status. As Martinican poet and philosopher, uh, Edouard Glisson has elaborated in his poetic circulation, intrusion of Negro blood haunts and causes obsessions of a family ancestry um, in the US and elsewhere. The Algerian soldiers fighting in the war of independence on the other hand, that Fanon himself later joined, I am embroiled in a power struggle in which the use of violence is undeniable. Their pathologies consist of hauntings triggered by the guilt of killing innocent Algerians. As an expert psychoanalyst, Fanon made seamless connections between racial and colonial pathologies, still the question of desire is inescapable in Fanon's discourse. 
Fanon says that there is no native who doesn't dream at least once, once a day of setting himself up in the settler's house, precisely referencing the fantasy of the slave. And by uttering this fantasy, Fanon awakens and brings this fantasy into language. For as philosopher and psychoanalyst Julia Kristeva argues, the role of language is essential for the formation of fantasies. In the cinematic visualization of Fanon's ideas, um, the fantasy of the slave and the native is brought to life. Kristeva make, makes a crucial link between pathology and desire when she writes, finally unconscious fantasies in the strict sense are those linked to unconscious desires. She proceeds to argue that the analytical method in psychiatry aims at getting to the source of symptoms. Analytical work consists of making the fantasy conscious, formulating the phantasmatic narrative and interpreting it in order to dissolve, in quotes, dissolve the symptom. Kristeva concludes, let us say that for Fanon, analytical work consists of revealing these unconscious fantasies in the realm of violent action and racism. The violence meted onto black bodies to protect wealth and property is what leads to pathology. And underneath this pathology is the desire of the, of the slave that Fanon articulates, that of setting themselves up in the settler's house. And if we are to go to the extreme, it is the right to own what the white man owns. In other words, the right to be free. We see this easily in Goran Olsen's film when a white settler in Rhodesia says that a black servant told his female master as he washed her car that one day he would be driving it. To this conscious spoken fantasy, the white settler being interviewed in the film retorted before we before getting out of Rhodesia, we would turn the lights off. This suggests something more violent, such as we would burn it all down rather than give it to the natives. Concerning violence as a cinematic picture is predominantly taken from the archive of European television stations. Archival footage marks the cinematic frame from Africa shot over different moments of anti-colonial uprising in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, Angola, and Guinea Conakry. What desires can be traced in these pictures? And furthermore, what unconscious fantasies are implied by those same desires? My criticism of this film written has been simple. Wasn't the non-aligned movement anti-colonial self-defense? Were these meetings and the various Pan-African Congresses not cinematic or cinematic. Their omission in Hugo Olsen's film is surprising. I have seen footage, for example, of Franz Fanon representing Algeria and Congo during a, an African meeting where he interfaces with Patrice Lumumba, the um, anti-colonial uh, sort of political figure from uh, Congo. Um, who was murdered in the 1960s. Is this special encounter not part of the general argument of the film that is to depict in a singular manner the anti-colonial movement? And so I, um, um, okay, so then I jump to um, notions of freedom as they occur uh, perhaps in the Caribbean um, where Fanon is actually coming from uh, with his book, Black Skins, White Masks, uh, Pinot Noir, Mask Blanc. Um, for Marxist historian C.L.R. James, the idea of return offers a kind of freedom. Return is symbolized by death or by cultural reenactment. What counts as freedom in James is this insurrectory memory that causes Black revolt. As discussed in Fanon, the question of desire and its intersection with racial and colonial pathology is where forms of freedom manifest. The desire to be white or becoming white. The fantasy of the natives to take up the house of the master. Freedom is, through Fanon's analytical work, premised on the natives' violent confrontations with and her ultimate anthropophagia of whiteness. Anthropophagia um, 
is a Brazilian um, Portuguese term that means the equivalent of cannibalizing, uh, cannibalizing whiteness. And they used it in Brazil to mean cannibalizing modernism um, in, in the visual arts. Goran Olsen's film, which remains didactic in its approach to Fanon's text, Fanon's text avoids producing a fiction of Fanon as a psychiatrist in the way that Isaac Julian and Mark Nash did in their 1995 feature film, Franz Fanon, Black Skin, White Mask, but instead reflect another kind of pragmatic philosophy. When we see women fighters in Mozambique camping in a forest where they have set up a typing and copying station to print and publish, it becomes evident that for Hugo Olsen, the production of knowledge is a site of freedom's manifestation. One of the cast of characters in this scene conveys to the camera an unspoken truth until that point, that a strategy of colonization was to disempower the native by denying them an education. Hence, the right to education is a right to freedom. This line of thinking diverges from Fanon's thesis by contradicting the dictum that violence is the only means to destroy colonialism, and in so doing, attain freedom for oppressed Algerians. While Fanon's idea of alienation is, is fundamental in assessing the condition of colonization, we must try to consider the sphere of education within the colony as extending a pragmatic philosophy espoused in the film that knowledge and its production are sites of manifesting freedom. To evoke Kant, freedom manifests itself through moral law. And while the origins of the law are not easily determined, the law can be grasped. The law is actual and it exists. Thus, if freedom to Kant is inextricably linked to law, then this law in the frame of colonization, Le Code Noir, which I mentioned earlier, Black Code, is an indication of the supremacy of the white man's values, according to Franz Fanon. In the film, um, the other uh, law in the frame of colonization would be the Penal Code, the Indian Penal Code from um, British India. Um, in the film, we are cast into a sphere of the detrimental policies of settler colonization, that is for Fanon, all forms of dispossession, including the burning and looting of anything the, slave, the native owns, chasing them off their land and repossessing it for purposes of mineral extraction and economic exploitation. I note here that Fanon's idea of alienation seamlessly connects to the context of the Caribbean, to that of French colonial Algeria both the Blacks and Mulattoes of the Antilles and the Algerians experience this profound economic alienation. This profound assessment of settler colonialism can be applied in many parts of the world, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Americas, that is, that violence has been equated to the dispossession of land and extermination or subordination of native people. Um, I'll continue a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm reading, yeah. In considering uh, Fanon's concerning violence and its translation to cinema, as the Goran Hugo Olsen feature film does, I am drawn to the diagnosis in Fanon that suggests that for the native, violence is the only means to real autonomy and freedom. Fanon, whose words are constantly displayed in bold letters on the screen and which are delivered with a rhythmic staccato flow by musician Lauren Hill, quote, colonized man finds his freedom in and through violence. This impulse in Fanon's writing can be described as Kantian in the sense that Gabriela Vastera confirms as providing freedom's existence. Vastera argues in Kant practic uh, in, that in Kant, practical reason is possibly aimed uh, at revealing the power of desire. Thus, Fanon follows Kant in his unwavering conviction in articulating and revealing the native's desires and fantasies. Basterra further explains how these ideas can be contradictory. How, for example, do we prove freedom's existence 
In her book, The Subject of Freedom, Kant Levinas, Basterra makes it clear that how freedom constitutes a subject is not easy to explain. She provides Kant, uh, Kant's, uh, she provides Kant's practical philosophy and is gesturing towards the power. She considers Kant's practical philosophy and is gesturing towards the power of desire, in quotes. Um, she, she quotes, um, proving freedom's existence and its causality in constituting the subject is the challenge of Kant's practical philosophy must meet. Here, uh, theoretical reason is charged with the formidable task of explaining how practical reason, a reason that does not reason, motivates the power of desire. Through Vasterra's readings of Kant, it becomes clear that Fanon's practical philosophy rests in the analytical work of psychiatry. The challenge, therefore, is in identifying colonized subjectivity through his patients' fantasies and perhaps through their desires. Fanon's writing diagnoses the colonized subject by identifying the fantasy, which is predominantly prominently featured in the film. There is no native who does not dream at least once a day of setting himself up in the settler's house. The freedom without condition, which Basterra calls into question, is described in her text as excess, in quotes, a word that Kant used. In Fanon, the same freedom without condition of colonial laws is a kind of anarchy, anarchic fantasy, whether conscious or unconscious. Fanon's analysis provides that the colonial subject is shaped by dreams of anarchy and the possibility of attaining these dreams. That is, his practical philosophy is characterized by the power of desire, a desire masked, at least in part, by violent dreaming. Okay, so then um, I guess I'll, I'll stop there for the moment. Um, yeah. That's kind of a lot, but I will sort of try and break it down again, or maybe I'll try and reread some of these questions. Um, so there was a question of what is desire, um, which is a question in Fanon, but also in Kant. Um, the question, what is the desire to be suddenly white, which is a question in Pinoir Mas Blanc, uh, Fanon's earlier text from 1957. What does it mean to desire whiteness? Another text, another question from his previous text. What is the role of language in the formation of fantasies? Um, that's a question that Julia Kristeva actually gives us. The role of language in the formulation of fantasies. Um, does the slave have any desires and what are they? Um, perhaps that's a question that I ask. Uh, what desires can be traced in the archival pictures, um, such as the one that we just saw now of um, uh, Fr France uh, declaring the war uh, in, uh, in Algeria, in French Algeria? Um, was was the national, the, the non-aligned movement a form of anti-colonial self-defense? Um, how does, how do forms of desire intersect with freedom? Um, how do forms of desire intersect with freedom? What is conscious fa fantasy and what is unconscious fantasy? Um, and then how do we, how do we prove freedom's existence? You know, this is a question that Avila Vasterra asks of, uh, of Kant. And, um, also, how does practical reason motivate the power of desire? Um, we could um, go around with any reflections um, that uh, you may have. Um, we could uh, also try and answer some of these questions, or we could um, uh, rewatch or watch a bit more of the. Of the 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 film in Algeria. I don't know, Kelly. Do you think we should watch a bit more of the film from Algeria or not? 
Um, if yeah, I think if it's useful for people, I feel like I'm seeing people's heads nodding. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Um, so okay, yeah, great. maybe we can we can watch like another little clip of it. So. Okay, great. Um, um, I'll just my change my screen, share my screen. Wait, yeah, I'll share my screen. Okay. Beaches of Algeria are just across the Mediterranean from the Riviera. The bathing suits are just as brief. The lovers just as tan. Algiers is wild and wicked and gay and naughty. The European there always saw something wild and exotic about the southern shore of the Mediterranean. At least until the night of November 1st, 1954, when the Algerian revolt against France began. Algerian Muslims took to the hills under the banner of a new organization, the FLN. They launched attacks on the French. French patrols in the back country were ambushed. smashed the villages of Muslims who opposed the FLN. Terror spread throughout Algeria. This was a nightclub, a time of record. The rebels in the field depended for their supplies on money raised from Algerians working in France. And so terror spread to the streets of Paris. Even late in the war, two Muslims a day died in France as collectors exacted contributions. In Algeria, Muslims divided over whether Algeria should remain French. This village opposed the FLN. In the Casbah, where several rebel groups vied for support, a secret ammunition dump exploded. At the peak of its strength in 1958, the FLN fielded an army of approximately 20,000 men. It ruled the Oris Mountains and it enforced its decisions. For six years, blood ran. French settlers and French troops killed in the fields, killed in ambush. The youth of France, the best families. The pretender to the throne of France watched his son buried with full military honors. No honors at all for Muslim victims of the FLN. 300 men and boys killed in one Algerian village. They supported the MNA, another Algerian independence movement. Then the major combat strength of the French army was thrown into Algeria. 400,000 men with all the weapons of modern war. on a bearskin rug with a baseball bat. More often than not, French troops arrived at a village only after the rebels had left it smoking. As the French troops moved up from one side, the rebels moved out the other. Finally, the French took drastic measures. The rebels had the backing of many fellow Muslims. They moved unnoticed in the midst of the civilian population. So the French moved the civilian population. Whole villages were rounded up and transported to camps where the French army could better supervise them.
Muslims showed their power in the cities by ordering general strikes. Muslims were ordered not to work. Kasbah shops were shut tight. So the French army opened them for business. But in the last two years of the long struggle, the tide turned. Saturation offensives by the French cut the power of the rebel National Liberation Army. Many rebels were captured or gave up. Their morale fell. Those forces still in the mountains, scattered into bands no larger than platoons. went on. Rebel dead, 150,000. Civilian dead, the same number. French losses, 10,000 men. Even on a relatively calm day, more than 25 men died in Algeria fighting on one side or the other, or just getting caught in the crossfire. Okay. Um... So we just watched more of that film, the propaganda film, um, about France's role in the uh, Algerian war. And uh, yeah, are there any reflections uh, in reference to the questions that I asked before or uh, also in I, I noticed now also in relation to uh, Franz Fanon's text uh, concerning violence as well um, and what its subject matter is essentially in French Algeria. But, um, Kelly, do you want to? Shall I just move down the um, line again? Yeah, or if okay. you yourself have any thoughts, don't hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. I'll let others start and then maybe share some thoughts. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Alejandra. Okay. Um, well, I was thinking in the questions and the question of desire. Um. The, um, how do we prove the freedom, especially that question, uh, because this is an archive uh, in the war, but then there was a liberation of the state, but I think I read that the colonized subject <laughs> still has the colonization structure by right. itself. So how to deal with that, uh, when, with that desire of freedom, when you have it, not in a, in a sense of a society, but then what to do with that? Because you still have that kind of a structure of, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, that's it. Uh, yeah, how to deal with that, yeah. Yeah. Um, Ellen, any thoughts? Um, I don't know, I guess I was actually kind of struck by the narration in this. I know that doesn't necessarily relate to a specific question, um, but at least, I don't know, I always feel like the narration is the same in these kind of propaganda films and the voice is always the same. And I think I was just, um, yeah, just struck for a moment on this narration. Um, I mean, I guess that could relate to the question of language. Um, yeah. What about the narration struck you, Ellen? Um, I mean, it's always this very like well-spoken, um, I guess like what you could say, like a colonizer kind of voice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very imposing and it's, uh, uh, you know, often the choice of um, words that they use in particular. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that um, uh, at, Go ahead. The, at the beginning of the class, like, I mean, like, just before the seminar started, I was talking with um, Sarah Beery just about the choice to use Lauren Hill to narrate um, 
the concerning violence. Uh, I don't know what to call that. Like if it's a movie, it's, if it's a documentary, I'm not quite sure exactly what it was meant to be. And sort of like just this tension that lies there with, with sort of like, I don't know, in documentary practice and just always sort of like having this voice be always assuming white man, <laughs> British, sort of like as this kind of like standard flattening of like the voice of God type of thing. And sort of like, what is, what is the tension that's caused with having a voice like Lauren Hill, or it could have been anybody else, you know, if it was Oprah, if it was like whoever it is, right? Um, that I don't know if it's, I don't know if the tension is that it's like, it causes this, it makes me, you know, like documentary always has a sort of like a claim to truth, but it's like one claim to truth. And now when you have Lauren Hill, it's like, what is, what is the angle here? Like, I don't know how to engage with this work mm. with this voice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that kind of also comes back, I think, um, um, when we talk about, um, yeah, I feel like the question of language sort of like is always sort of there um, somehow when Lauren Hill actually suddenly starts to, well, I mean, in reference to sort of like the, the film that we just watched, I mean, the language sort of always has this weird sort of like um, ascribing uh, onto the, 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 the colonial subject. Um, oh, the Muslim Algerians, or um, it says, Oh, the relationship between French and Algerians uh, has been going well for the most part until, um, uh, or, you know, the, the, the scene with the funerals and then they show all the funerals uh, with like the, the kind of French soldiers or the French, the, the French uh, citizens. And then uh, all the, Alger the, like the scenes of the Algerians are sort of like these bodies that are rotting and then the, the, the voice over actually uh, it says something about, well, you know, they will not receive uh, any funerals or they will not receive any burials or something like this. Um, language has a way of really um, affirming or it's this kind of confirmation bias, right? That there's, you know, of, of what the colonial subject is and what the colonial subject should be. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Kelly, yeah, to your question about like sort of Lauren Hill sort of being a comment about Lauren Hill, it's interesting because like it does something, it, it's, it does, it sort of displaces completely like the meaning of Fanon's sort of te text in a way. I mean, you wouldn't even know that he's actually describing what we just watched in this clip, you know, right. because of how good it sounds, because of how contemporary it sounds um, <laughs> you're kind of like oh is she just like reading poetry or like is she talking about something that's like happening right now um, but I think when you watch this other film and you sort of contrast the two you see how um, yeah just how maybe disconnected you know um, the, the voiceover can be from the reality of, mm -hmm. of the content, yeah. Um, Nikki, did you, did you wanna? Sure. Um, I, apologies, my network kicked me off and I missed the majority of the clip. But I did find it interesting, um, the ideas and desire to fuel nationalism. Um, and what is, I, I, I guess I'm questioning, what is, what is this nationalism ultimately for? Is it for support of the war? Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's different. Um, yeah, and I, I, I kind of want to echo Kelly's sentiment about Lauren Hill, because it's so, I, like, it struck me as like very, very fascinating. Um, um, I don't have too many thoughts on that. At first I thought it was, um, like trying to like symbolically put the voice of black women into into the discourse and into yeah. the discourse when they've been excluded. 
Okay. Yeah, but then <laughs> I guess I guess for me then it was it was it was like um, it's in, yeah I'm like okay maybe that's what was trying to happen but then it's still narrating yeah. word for word Fanon's yeah. text so it's kind of like okay so do we not speak for ourselves? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Ellen, did you wanna? Oh, did I? Did I already? I mean, I already said something. I was just then thinking that, I mean, could it be argued that by using Lauren Hill, it's kind of just, uh, I don't know, almost like a, like a cinematic Hollywood, even though it's not a Hollywood film, but just a push to gain a wider audience. And, you know, if you pick someone like Lauren Hill's fame to narrate it, you're instantly going to hope to appeal to more people. If right. in actual essence, it does then exclude and contro cause controversy among, among some. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Um, sorry. So you, you kind of are identifying the use of Lauren Hill's voice as a form of fantasy. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, I haven't actually seen the film, so I don't know how it fully plays out. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm necessarily, you know, so drawn to Lauren Hill's voice, but, you know, she's a huge star. And by using that, perhaps it is this kind of, I, I don't know, I don't know if, they even the filmmaker knows her or if there's a more personal element into her choice but yeah that was just my initial thought without having seen the film obviously mm -hmm. well you have seen part of the film i mean the introduction is in my opinion the film because the, after that there is no contextualization it's just fanon's text and lauren hill's voice an archival image. <laughs> like an archival image. No contextualization happens after that. The only contextualization, like you know how films, um, even documentaries are meant to sort of give you a sort of like, oh, we were on a quest and then we went here and then we went here and then now we, this is what we have learned. None of that. There is zero, <laughs> like zero learning, you know? Um, so in a way that the film for me actually is, is, is actually that preface because that preface is so accurate in its, um, and also in its confrontations as well. Like Spivak is confronting like this filmmaker. And I don't know if a filmmaker understands that <laughs> because it's so opposed to the narration that we were actually listening to in the previous film, for example, the one that we just saw. Um, She's not narrating. She's not a voiceover Spivak. She's actually part of, you know, um, or kind of locating um, Fanon in the present moment, but also really pushing back against. Yeah, so I, I do think that your um, reflections are on point. Yeah. Even though you, you haven't seen the rest of the film, I think um, they are really on point. Um, cool. Um, Kirsten? Um, I, I, I guess to follow on those comments, I wonder to what extent we could consider um, um, Olson's use of, um, oh, the, the, could consider the use of Gayatri and um, Lauren Hill as a kind of legitimation um, of Olson's project because of the way he takes, as Saru very mentioned, he, he doesn't really provide any contextual information and his strategy as a filmmaker is sort of, um, although he's presenting material that's very much not neutral, his personal strategy is, is, so I happened to be at the premiere of this film at Sundance, oddly, and um, it was very interesting because he, um, he was questioned by an audience member who had worked as a journalist covering liberation movements in Africa. And this uh -huh. journalist was very upset because of what had happened post independence in a lot of nations. And he thought that it was ethically um, 
irresponsible to present the material in this way. And there's problems to both his stance and Olson's, which was basically non, a non-response and, um, and, um, and a refusal to take any sort of position on any of the material he was presenting. So I, I think that he has this strategy of neutrality and he's taking these archives and doing very little with them. Obviously he's making choices, but he's not taking a stance on the kinds of choices or being explicit about the kinds of choices he's making. Mm. And so then in that case, I wonder to what extent he's kind of using Gyatri Spivak and Lauren Hill to sort of ventriloquize his own, his own role or something or, or to, to kind of legitimize his strategies. But um, yeah, so that's one follow up on those questions. I was also curious in general, watching this um, documentary film about how much of the footage kind of um, shows up slightly reworked or, or it, the kind of visual parallels between this and the Battle of Algiers and, and the way the Battle of Algiers kind of reworks this footage um, for a very different end. So thinking about these reworkings of the archive and the role of desire in that, just to prompt further discussion. Yeah, that's totally interesting. Um, yeah, that's totally interesting, um, especially when you talk about like the idea of like reworking the footage or re reworking, reorganizing. Obviously, there has to be some kind of desire in cinema. Cinema is a sort of like machine of, of desiring. It's a... Uh, I don't know if it's like just coincidental, <laughs> but like it definitely cinema is definitely um, a strong machine for desire um, that makes us. And so in a way we can say that some of these images can be pornographic, you know, because of how strongly they kind of like pull us in and draw us in and make us um, kind of almost numb to what we're looking at. Um, yeah, I mean, that also reminds me, I don't know if you've uh, come across Zontag's um, book uh, on the pain of others, mm -hmm. um, that actually talks about like um, press photography in the 20th century, I think from the beginning of the 20th century, and particularly images of war. And she um, was responding to a particular series of essays that Virginia Woolf wrote about war, but also um, kind of reports report, reports on war that happened uh, in the UK while the uh, Second World War was happening, if not the first. I'm, I'm not too sure which one. Um, but um, uh, The Three Guineas, I think that's the text that Virginia Woolf writes, and then um, Susan Zontag responds to that text. It's a very interesting way about reading um, sort of this intertextuality of like image and text. But I think that that's also what you're hinting at, um, how accurate is the sort of like um, narration and the footage that we're looking at and what is the story actually? What is the report here? Like what is being reported? Um, and beyond that, I think there's also the question of ethics, right, which is what is the ethical responsibility? This journalist that you sort of like um, heard ask Hugo also, what is the ethical responsibility of a report? Um, and so in a way, I want to ask if these images remain as reportage or whether they are transformed into this kind of cinematic um, machine of desire, the desirable pictures uh, for us to look at. Um, mm -hmm. No. Um, Alexei, do you have anything that you would like to? Uh, yeah, it was already a bit discussed uh, in relation to the narration line of the movie, and I especially like how they bend the uh, narration to make it look somehow logical, and the story falls like that at, at the beginning it's peaceful and then the rise up starts and it's all war and then the, the funniest part is like let's defend France but in Algeria and they go there with the troops and stamps and stuff. Uh, so the questions I've been thinking about is uh, what does it mean to desire whiteness and I think uh, because uh, 
it was uh, constructed uh, very much in binary terms uh, that uh, uh, so in this regard to desire white whiteness is to desire basically everything that is attributed to the whiteness and everything that is on the normal side of of the human in in compared in contrast to the the other side which is always inferior to to the white part and uh, in, in, at the same time, does the slave have any desire in what are they? Uh, it made me think that if we think uh, beyond this binary idea of desire, maybe uh, if we also, uh, it, I, I was thinking about the Spivax, uh, can the subaltern speak? Is that uh, can the subaltern desire? So maybe in this sense, the, the colonized would desire to to be able to desire independently not be restricted to this uh, binary uh, binary logic and uh, i also had a question you, you mentioned some question that yulia kristova was asking and i couldn't hear it uh, could you please repeat it just for me to make note, note of it right um uh you know Kristeva, um asks um what is the role of language in the formation of fantasies? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, thank you. No, thank you so much for that. I mean, um, can the subaltern speak? Again, we're going back to this question of Lauren Hill um, and uh, her role in the in the actual documentary um, and all the role of women in, in being represented um, in concerning violence as a form. Um, but also can the subaltern desire? I think that's really uh, a really interesting sort of like uh, reworking of that question. Um, yeah. Mm. Maybe, uh, Sebastian, do you have any question? There was one of those questions, those main kind of like topical questions that stuck with me. There was also about desire and it went something along the lines of kind of like dichotomizing between conscious and unconscious desire. Mm -hmm. And then it made me think of desires that are, um, that, that are not, um, I don't want to say consensual, but are, uh, that are somehow against, that are working against ourselves, which is, I guess, the most of, the most of desires that we have. So I guess the most of the, the, of the desires are non, non-consensual in that way. So I wanted to, yeah, say how this works in relation to um, cinema as this desiring machine apparatus or to the, um, post-colonial kind of like a, the crux of post-colonial critique in general yeah 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 thank you for that yeah i think that um yeah i think that desire sort of comes from um at least from this sort of kantian notion of freedom really uh and um i think within kant i think that's very very clear that this idea of the power of the desire is really where um, we begin to sort of, um, I, I guess, delineate or maybe um, see strongly how Kant's practical philosophy can be enacted. But then um, Bastera is sort of like creating this sort of very real confrontation with Kant and saying that, well, how do we actually identify freedom? Like, what does freedom exist really um, at the end of the day? And um, just going back to Ale uh, Alejandra's sort of um, position there about you know what happens after anti-colonial violence and after independence, like if colonial structures still exist, then um, wh what does that actually do um, to um, this question of um, of freedom? But uh, for me, implicitly, it's also the question of desire. Like, have the desires gone away? Like you know, what kind of antagonism exists, you know, suppressed. And so we're actually now in the unconscious um, sort of phase of, of 
of desires that may or may not have gone away. Um, but for sure, uh, Yulia Kristeva's sort of point is, is to actually, or her, her, her mission actually is to, is to say that analytical work in general is about identifying um, these uh, unconscious fantasies in particular. And I think that's really difficult. And I think um, Fanon is trying to actually do that. He's trying to identify these unconscious fantasies. Um, Uh, I wonder if Alejandra, are you still, do you have some thoughts on? Well, it is, uh, it's a different thing, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking in the translate, translate, uh, think of this kind of the, of archives, uh, in, in the same question of language, uh, this voice of white men, uh, when they translate this to Spanish, they still has the same, I would say, music in their voice. No, like, uh, oh, in 1988, no sé qué, no? But still the same, but in different languages. No, yeah. yeah. I was thinking about it, that this kind of uh, project uh, that appears in the entire world, no? that it's not only in, in English or wherever, no? that has like a machinery, like a machine. Mm. It's, it's like a machine of language and in different, mm. yeah. I was thinking in that, but it's the, the, another, the other part of the discussion with the language and the voice. Right. It's more like a tone. Mm. Not right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I absolutely, um, I see your point. I mean, I think, um, I think that question of language, I think, sort of keeps recurring uh, also because it's um, it's where also um, I feel um, maybe uh, Spivak is pointing us towards because I think Spivak is also making us aware of the fact that um, that the language is also a bit more complex in, fa in Fano and, uh, and that we have to account for, um, for it uh, differently than how, you know, um, or maybe she's uh, maybe also posing this question in trying to say that Fanon has been perhaps misunderstood uh, in a way. Um, and that uh, his, uh, his thoughts uh, on violence are not uh, really about violence because they, or not that his thoughts are not about violence. <laughs> I think she's trying to say that they're more than about violence because there's something else that is in the language that he's using. And, and I think when we talk about, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the next section that I was, I'm, I'm sort of like uh, really looking at um, Fanon's um, sort of various accounts uh, and his, you know, the pathologies that he's sort of talking about in his book. But I think that there's a, there's a very, very strong uh, thematic there. And there's a very strong sort of like, um, how do you call it? There's a very strong unrelenting sort of like uh, meter, you know, that um, where we understand Fanon and his, um, uh, and his perspective, you know, in relation to fantasy more directly um, as, as being really, you know, fully, you know, um, expanding the dialogue around uh, guilt and, um, you know, you know, the, the guilt of his patients, of course, as soldiers fighting in a, in, you know, in a liberation army. Um, he also examines, you know, um, French soldiers, white, like white soldiers as well. And um, yeah, there's, there's all these layers um, sort of like that, that happen in, in, but I think that that's the other thing that has been part of the intellectual history in relation to Fanon is that 
you know, first of all, the preface was attacked. <laughs> the preface by Jean Paul Sartre to the wretched of the earth was attacked very strongly by President Sartre and by um, the magazine, which, you know, I'll talk about more in the next session. But there's an intellectual history that has been literally resisting and, and going against interpretations of Fanon in the sort of, I think, uh, um, the Afro-diasporic French sort of world, um, the, the French-speaking world, yeah. Um, and I think these are also about mistranslations and how Fanon sort of is translated into English as well and enters into the English Academy there's like, or the American Academy as well, there's like a very um, intense um, sort of series of misreadings that, that keep happening, I suppose. Um, but also inscri inscriptions of new and other um, grammars and voices as well, you know, while we sort of meditate on the condition of of violence and the condition of post-colonial. Uh, post so I just want to, um, yeah, I mean, I want to sort of go through the rest of these um, very quickly and then, um, maybe maybe I won't go through everything, but um, Kelly, how much time do you have? How much time? Yeah. Uh, just under half an hour. Oh, we, we have half an hour. Okay. Yeah, I think it goes until 1.30 now. Yeah, I didn't realize we were already, um... We, yeah, it's one now. Okay, um... <laughs> okay, so I'll very quickly sort of like read just, um, just about one of his patients, one of Fanon's patients, um... Uh, okay, so um, according to Kristeva, um, the, there are, there are um, uh, both conscious and unconscious fantasies upon whose identification a, a condition is diagnosed. Identifying this fantasy is key in uplifting the patient's psychological health. Fanon's case studies in Les Danes de la Terre, his patients whose accounts are noted and reproduced in the book provide the basis for his post-colonial critique and Kantian analysis. The invocation of the colonized man finds his freedom in and through violence directly emerges from the dutiful and careful study of his patients and Fanon's commitment towards their psychological well-being. While there are many patients examined in Le Danais, two patients in particular stand out. On page 264, Fanon writes of his patient, case number three, an Algerian male soldier fighting on behalf of the National Liberation Army. When he started thinking of his mother, the disembodied woman rose up before him in redoubled horror. Uh, mention is made in the text that the soldier had been part of a mission that left two Algerian civili civilians killed, implied that, implying that these killed were women, um, native uh, women. Firstly, this is a nightmare, and secondly, that the actual fantasies about a woman that the male Algerian soldier has murdered in the course of defending the National Liberation Front, the Nationalist Anti-Colonial Organization of Algerians. Earlier in the same section of the book on his patients, Fanon brings up the question of guilt, which in a footnote he attributes to Sigmund Freud's mourning and melancholia. The idea that one has survived dying in a war uh, where others have died comes back in this section and with this patient. Is this survivor's guilt? Um, the terror that he experiences and the nature of the wounded and the dead woman in the nightmare is possibly triggered to use Freudian analysis um, by a guilt of, of having committed a murder. Uh, Fanon quotes, at night that evening, as soon as the patient went to the bedroom, to the bed, the room was invaded by women in spite of everything. While no actual fictional adaptation of these fantasies appears in the Hugo Olsen film, the closest to horror the filmmaker gets 
is in the battle scene in the forest as the Portuguese army is fighting in Guinea, um, where one of the Portuguese soldiers is wounded. In this dire condition, four or five men perform a medical procedure on him. Um, and since you haven't seen it, I should describe it in detail. Um, basically, um, there's four or five soldiers, uh, Portuguese soldiers fighting in the war of liberation. Well, the war in, um, in Guinea Conakry, um, and uh, this is the same war that um, uh, is associated with Amilka Cabral and, uh, well, okay, let me just describe the scene. So you can imagine uh, three or five soldiers in a forest, basically. Um, uh, one of them is wounded, I think his leg uh, is, I think it entirely torn, blown off. And so the, the flesh is literally hanging out. Um, and one of the soldiers is holding up a, a, a sort of water drip and that, that is uh, dripping into uh, the body of the, of the wounded. And they're standing there. And then slowly as the film progresses, uh, so footage rolls, um, they move the body. And so the, they're kind of moving the soldier away all of them into a different part. And you can see the agony that the soldier is in. Um, I think they're performing a medical procedure, but it's not too clear if they have medical tools or if the tools are improvised. Um, and um, my first thinking when I saw that was that uh, obviously this has something to do with a medical procedure. Maybe that's why Hugo Olsen sort of thought it would be apt to put it in the film. Uh, secondly, these are soldiers fighting on behalf of Portugal, uh, which also was in the Algerian War, French soldiers fighting on behalf of France, but not only, there were native soldiers, Algerians fighting on behalf of France. Um, and it's very unclear how, how everything happens after that, you know, like it's very unclear. Um, yeah, it's 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 a very um, it, it's a very um, shocking uh, sort of image to see, and so um, the the horror of it uh, generally sort of is about this inability to uh, contain uh, the wounded soldier, this inability to contain the the sort of like the wounding and the bleeding, and um, and yeah, I think that's a very uh, intense sort of picture. Um, for Fanon, the fantasy that is identified in these soldiers is for the most part unconscious and the patient is not necessarily aware of it or its impact on his psyche. Um, and so the point that Sebastian brought earlier about unconscious fantasies sort of also appears in Fanon's patients. Um, the fantasy here of being haunted and terrorized by dead or zombie-like women speaks to Fanon's analysis in which the overall experience of violence and dispossession is at the center of the analysis. It's possession of property, as in case number three, armed, um, sorry, armed, armed and gendered violence. And so then, um, so Fanon takes a special interest in pathologies related to desire and its manifestation in his, his patients. And to echo Bastera's argument, this is not a coincidence considering that for Kant, whom Fanon follows closely, it is within the sphere of desire that a kind of unconditioned freedom can be traced. So, um, yeah, this, you know, desire keeps coming back, it keeps coming back. How, how we sort of articulate desire, how we look through desire, like where desire is sort of like um, embedded, uh, whether it's desire in whiteness or uh, it's um, these kinds of um, unconscious fantasies that are sort of triggered by um, a survivor's guilt, so to speak, or a different kind of guilt. 
Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that um, um, what is not talked about in the Hugo Olsen film also is that um, there were many soldiers who fought on behalf of France that were Algerian. And after the war was lost, or before the war was lost actually, France promised these soldiers that they would be repatriated to France in the event of the loss. Unfortunately, unfortunately that, um, unfortunately that was not the case. Um, France did never actually repatriated these soldiers after the war ended. Um, and then they were stuck in Algeria. They were stuck in Algeria. Uh, and they, um, and the National Liberation Front proceeded to uh, kill them, basically. They were, from what I read in the various sort of accounts, yeah, there were tens of thousands, more than 20 or 30,000 soldiers were killed brutally in Algeria after the war had ended, like literally in the moment of liberation. Sorry, were these French, French uh, soldiers are you talking about or? They were Algerian. Algerian soldiers who were on behalf of France. On behalf of France, okay. Yeah. Mm. And so I think I have that question about, um, you know, the way we understand, you know, questions of violence. So maybe not even violence, but rather desire, I think, you know, because now we're talking about the fantasies that are unconscious and those which are conscious. And so one of the things that um, is, is an unconscious fantasy is this idea of the guilt of having murdered Algerian civilians. Um, in Fanon's patients, or in, in case number three, the Algerian soldier. Um, and even more than that, in having murdered women. So the soldier is guilty for murdering a woman, and he constantly talks to Fanon, who is his doctor, about um, being, being um, how do you call it? Uh, feeling like he killed his mother, you know, constantly being haunted by this picture of, of having, or oh, the thought of having killed his mother. So I just, I wonder what kinds of unconscious fantasies, um, other, so other kinds of fantasies and desires and, and other things sort of um, surround other other soldiers in the world, such as those who, in any case, were, were fighting on behalf of France, you know? Um, so, yes. Um, would anybody like to comment or... <laughs> um, I could also just, like, pick people at random again. Sure, sure. Let me um, go ahead. Uh, Kirsten? Um, let me think. I'm, tr I'm trying to gather some thoughts right now. I can comment in a little bit. Okay. If that's all right. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, Alejandra? No, not right now. No. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, I can I can try to um, maybe summarize some. Of the <laughs> I, I think because this example was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, too much. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I can I can try and give an example. Or well, I'll try and summarize some of the previous questions. Uh, maybe that would um, clarify some things um, as well. 
So we um, earlier talked about, you know, how do we prove that freedom exists? And I think that that's really what led to a lot of the conversations that we, we're having uh, at, the, at this moment, whether after independence is achieved, freedom actually does exist. And so um, the other sort of question, I think, going back to Sebastian, um, about um, desires which are unconscious and fantasies which are unconscious is very interesting also because um, what that means is then after independence has ended, what happens to those desires uh, and, and which desires and which, which unconscious desires sort of like still exist? Do they linger? Do they subside? Um, and are they ever, you know, fully analyzed? So this question of pathology or not, maybe not even pathology, to be honest, um, just desire. Um, of course, Pastera's critique of Fanon, of, of um, sorry, Kant, um, in, in terms of practical reason, and um, how does practical reason motivate the power of desire? I mean, because practical reason is, in any case, uh, sort of implying that desire is really where our power rests and our power lies. Um, a desire to know oneself, the desire to, to act, the desire to, etc. Um, but, you know, I think Pastera poses a very interesting question to, um, to, to Kant in the sense that, um, yeah, how does um, then um, the questions in practical philosophy sort of also encounter this sort of um, deep um, and complex subject of desire and, um, and whether actually freedom actually exists or not. In short, you know, in a way, is our desiring of freedom even something that, you know, is, is practical, you know, to, to sort of use a word that Kant would, would be interested in using. Um, and then to go back to, um, to Alexei's question about the slaves, you know, did the slaves have any forms of desires and fantasies? And so then there's that, also, there's that question, so, um, are enslaved people, you know, if, so in a situation, so uh, do, does a slave have any desire? And are there any unconscious fantasies also to do with the slave? And this is an interesting sort of, um, it, it's a very interesting, um, there's a, um, an artist called Simon Lee who, recently opened a show at the Guggenheim called Loophole of Retreat, which is actually, um, that Loophole of Retreat is based on a short story that um, is, what's well, not a short story, it's actually a journal of, of a slave girl who ran away. Um, and uh, it's actually just describing, you know, like that she was kind of in, uh, imprisoned almost in this cage. Um, and that there was this, there was this literally this hole, this kind of hole where she could actually see people and talk to people. Uh, and so in a way it's kind of like trying to understand uh, or her exhibition was trying to sort of like follow up on these kinds of uh, images of, of, of desiring, but also images of, of um, perhaps of that kind of fantasy, perhaps of anarchy, you know, um, what would it be like, you know, type of questions. Mm. Um, and so these questions are not limited to their context in a way because these are more, as I suppose, topical questions. Um, even the question of master slave is, is you know, I, I assume that's an abstract question in Hegel, to be honest. It's not um, necessarily a dichotomy as the way that it appears in Hegel in real life. And so we have a, a sort of broad range of, of options there to think about 
when desire enters into the question and and when fantasy as well sort of like arises into the subject. Um, we also asked about um, desires that may fuel nationalism and um, sort of what the consequences or what nationalism is for. Again, you know, going back to this idea of what well, does freedom exist? <laughs> but that was sort of question. Um, so voice and speech and choice of words in particular, um, the voice of Lauren Hill in particular, but also then Alexei pointed out, you know, can the subaltern speak and then can the subaltern desire? You know, if you think of Lauren Hill in this film as a subaltern, you know, like what is that voice actually doing? What is that speech actually doing? Um, and so that's also a very interesting sort of like um, the colonial subject still has the colonial structure. Um, and this is a question that Alejandra sort of brought um, in. Um, so what has happened since colonization? You know, the question of freedom again. So I guess I'm repeating myself here, but um, yeah, some of these are sort of broader questions. I can jump in now if, if that helps. Yeah, um, I, I guess I wanted to return to Spivak maybe to think about some of these questions about freedom. Because um, it seems to me, she, she almost implies that she doesn't believe that freedom does exist, but it's something that is um, always, out, always out of reach, but that you have to pr practice all the same or something. Um, and that to one of her interventions with Fanon is a desire, I think, to, to bring his text almost to find a text that he hasn't written or wasn't able to write because he didn't live, but what he, what he would have, what, what might have been written had he lived that accounts for the perpetuation of violence and the always, kind of always elusive dream of freedom um, mm -hmm. that was never attained after independence. And um, so Spivak's reading of Fanon is kind of almost a creation of a new Fanon text that would that would possibly address this. Um, so there's a role of desire in her own intervention, I think, too. And um, um, yeah, uh, maybe that's good. But also I wonder about cinema of return. Um, and it seems to me that there's a lot of work around returns in film to these moments of liberation struggles right now or in the past, I mean, this film is, I don't know how many years old now, six years maybe, but in the past 10 years or so, and um, how this is also a sort of questioning of, um, of, of the, of the um, uh, unrealized dream of freedom on Olson's part which is a little bit paradoxical from his position, but, but that's all. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and, uh, no, go ahead. Um, thanks. I'm done, I think I messed up this. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. I, I, I was just like, I unmuted my microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, I was finished. I was, I think I, didn't hear you because I. Ah. Okay. Sorry. I, I, and then I muted my microphone and then, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, no, I, yeah, I heard you. I heard you. Thank you for your contribution. Yeah. That was very, um, very clearly thought. It was like, wow. Okay. Um, and yeah, yeah. This, this question of return is like, it's actually a question that has haunted. Um, uh, has haunted, uh, yeah, just the intellectual history of, of, of Caribbean and African writers and uh, to an extent African American writers as well. Well, to a large extent, um, I feel. Um, of course, the question of the Middle Passage is, is 
completely about return. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, the question of return is like, it's, it is present, definitely. And it's being explored um, as well. Um, thank you. Um, we actually have just a few more minutes left. Uh, so maybe we can wrap it up so that it is nicely wrapped up for somebody else who watches this. <laughs> online, uh, I have an organization question. Will we have uh, what was yes. the final assignment or how the course is going to be reorganized and uh, how it's going to be assessed and stuff like this? Ah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so we have an assignment every week, which is to produce a review of the film that we're uh, discussing every week. Um, this week it was to review the preface from Concerning Violence. Next week is to review um, uh, Le Statue Mohosi, which is Statues Also Die. Uh, filmed by Alain René and Chris Marker. Um, and uh, yes, I should have that review in my inbox basically right now, but um, <laughs> I will give you some allowance. Um, please send it in the next few days. Um, the final, yeah, I mean, since we have four sessions, I, I would like to see how um, you engage um, in these um, seminars um, and I would actually prefer a kind of um oh okay uh, my email uh, I, I will send my email later um, or like yeah I will um I, I'll I can send you guys an email and then maybe you can share them with me and I'll forward them or something we'll figure it out can yeah I I, yeah I can share my I can share my email um it could be also just on my new center email, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but I, because before I think I, I sort of said, in the previous class I said like the, um, the system to sort of like Google Classroom where you can upload the, <laughs> you can upload your sort of like uh, essays or on Google Classroom and only one person did that. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I assume it's going to be similar in this class. <laughs> um, but if it's, I think it's easier just to send me an email uh, and I, I will sort of like, I, I would pretty like to have a, a, a position, not a position paper, but an argumentative essay on one question that you find strings through all the sort of seminars or one that you feel very compelled to write about. Um, and that would be a 900 word essay but that doesn't preclude uh, uh, that doesn't include the um, the two hundred word um, reviews on each film. So um, perhaps that's a lot of work. Uh, but I, I would really like you know to, uh, you you to engage a lot. That's why I'm I'm sort of um, asking you to write these reviews and. And then the, the the paper. I can I can put this all in writing as well, mm -hmm. so that you have a sense of um, of the assignments, the overall assignments. Yes. Yeah, I can send a um, I can send an email um, after this with just that, and maybe I'll also get like the questions that you have posed through this throughout this class um, in writing um, okay. just just for people to be able to like sort of sit with them because I think I don't remember all of them clearly so I don't imagine that everybody else yeah. does either. The first question was what is violence? <laughs> <laughs> I mean yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, it's been a fantastic uh, opportunity to uh, spend these few hours uh, with you and um, I look forward to the next seminar. Um, uh, for the next seminar, please um, have your assignment, um, the 200 word review of Lestatima Hossi uh, prepared. 
beforehand. Um, that would be very useful because it's also a very, um, I will go a lot into issues of intellectual history, which are very sometimes boring, to be honest. Uh, it's just who didn't like who and who did not agree with so-and-so and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of very boring. So if you've actually looked at the film and actually have some thoughts on it, that would make the class more interesting. Um, otherwise, uh, Présence Africaine and Le Statement aussi are just like very, very, um, uh, how do you call, very rigid kind of uh, history of literature um, and, and, and in, in relation to France, particularly. So um, you, might, you may not all find that very compelling as a, as a topic, but um, I'm hoping to hear more of your thoughts in the next class. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. All right. I'm going to actually stop recording now. You've stopped recording? <laughs>